We hope that you are ready to learn and to gain a better sense of what cannabis education for chefs looks like today. However, please note a quick legal disclaimer. We are not doctors. We are not lawyers. We are chefs. Cannabis is not federally legal at this time, and we will not be inferring any legal or specific medical advice during this webinar. Just simply sharing the opinions of chefs who are currently working with infused foods, insights from those who are teaching at cannabis and edibles educational programs in the U.S., and to inspire food service professionals and students who may be seeking to earn the credential, the ACF Specialized Certificate in Culinary Cannabis. Thank you for tuning in, and now let's begin today's presentation. Welcome to ACF Chefs Forum. Thank you for joining us today from across the country and beyond for today's special program. We know it's so important for culinarians to connect, to share, and to offer inspiration and information, which is exactly why we're excited to have an expert here with information just for you, the leaders and future leaders of the food service industry. Although for some, culinary cannabis may be a controversial topic, According to studies, over 66% of Americans support legalizing marijuana. Cannabis has moved onto the dinner table and the opportunity for chefs to enter this industry is growing. Today, let's focus on facts, awareness, and new opportunities in the food service industry. I'm Jackie Bressinger, American Culinary Federation's Director of Strategic Partnerships, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar and appreciate you tuning in to today's presentation and cannabis education. During the presentation, we'll be taking questions live during the webinar as we are able. Please use the chat function to collaborate with the other chefs and students tuning in and the Q&A function to pose questions to today's featured chef. All right, so let's get that conversation going in the chat. If you haven't already, please let us know where you're tuning in from today. So just a little background on today's featured guest. Chef Nathan Koshelski has been an educator for almost 20 years and has been a culinary instructor for the past seven years at Niagara Falls Culinary Institute. Chef earned his master's degree in career and technical education from the State University of New York College at Buffalo, as well as an associate's degree in culinary arts from the Pennsylvania Culinary Institute. He has earned his ACF certified culinary educator and his ACF specialized certificate in culinary cannabis and edibles. His interest in culinary cannabis led him to design NCFI's Innovative Special Topics courses, which focus on educating student chefs about the proper handling and dosing of THC-laced ingredients, as well as non-THC ingredients such as hemp and CBD. Jeff, we are very thankful to have you with us today. And at this time, I'm passing the presentation over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I really, really appreciate all of you in attendance today. Uh, professional development is such an important topic, and being in attendance for any professional development, of course, is a great thing. But I think when it's something as important as culinary cannabis, it, it takes on a whole new threshold. I know our time is extremely limited today. I, I could talk about culinary cannabis for days on upon days. So I'm going to try to move as fast as I can. I know there will be resources available and sent emailed out to all of you folks uh, tomorrow uh, for your attending today. So anything that we go by a little too quickly, I know there will be resources available to all of you. Just a little background of wh where and why I created this course. Uh, I, I have been teaching at the Niagara Falls Culinary Institute it, for the past seven years and going and talking to former students, asking them what we could have done different at culinary school. One thing that I had a few students reach out to me and tell me was they, I, they wish they would have been taught more about culinary cannabis. We're located in New York State. I was doing this uh, research about five years ago. Uh, cannabis was still illegal in New York State at that time, but we had students leaving our culinary school in New York State and moving to the West Coast having the opportunity to work with culinary cannabis and they they had no idea how to and i thought what a disservice we we are a culinary school and you know our beliefs on cannabis may be different but we we are having students leave here there's nothing saying they're staying in the state that they're attending culinary school in and they need to be able to work with all of in the ingredients uh in a healthy and safe flavorful manner so at that point, I, I started brewing the idea in my head to start a culinary cannabis course. But again, 
it, it, at the time it was still legal, illegal in New York State uh, about five years ago. So, you know, thankfully about three years ago, the ACF created the specialized certificate in culinary cannabis and edibles. And once the ACF created this, this wonderful certificate, I knew I could go to my administration of my college and say, listen, our accredited body, the ACF, who already accredited our institute, they now have a certificate in culinary cannabis. We, our chefs are already certified through the ACF. Let, let me get this certificate and let me teach about culinary cannabis. I did not know how my administration would go for this, being that it was still illegal in New York State at the time. And they they believed in me. They said, go for it. And for the once I got their approval, I, I, I spent every waking moment uh, studying and researching everything I needed to to pass this culinary exam, which I'm going to talk about today. It is a very in-depth exam. Uh, I thought I knew a lot about cannabis before preparing for the culinary cannabis, cannabis exam, and I really knew nothing about the topic. So uh, it, it was such wonderful professional development for me to uh, get this certificate through the ACF and learn about culinary cannabis. Uh, and, you know, it. It, the one thing that I really enjoy about cannabis, too, is I, I always I always like to talk about this is we live in a wonderful time where we live in a global market. Pretty much any ingredient we want, we can have shipped to us, you know, overnight. Uh, being a chef 100 years ago, I, I think would have been so um, exciting because you were always being exposed to new ingredients. I often think about uh, Charles Randhofer, who ran Del Monaco Steakhouse in New York, uh, New York City. And he, he was the first chef to introduce uh, an avocado, and he called it an alligator pear. But how, how amazing would it have been to serve these new ingredients that no one else has ever tried? That's the magic with cannabis. It is a new ingredient. It, 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 this is going to be the only ingredient in our lifetimes that shops that we get to work with that has new flavor profiles that we and the public have not been exposed to yet. So it's, it, it's very exciting. I'm going to dive right into my PowerPoint presentation about culinary cannabis, uh, the certification, and everything that has to go along with uh, getting certified with this important certification. So one, once again, you know, the American Colony Federation, they, they led the way and, and really they, they had the, the foresight. They, they, they were proactive enough to get the certification up and running several years ago. And it is uh, titled the Specialized, Specialization Certificate in Colony Cannabis and Edibles. Candidates who are eligible for this course, you have to either be currently ServSafe certified or have an eight hour course in food safety and sanitation. Uh, I, I know I have, at the end of teaching my culinary cannabis class that I teach at NFCI, my students take this, uh, this exam um, and many of my students don't have their serve safe exam yet. So they take the eight hour course uh, through the ACF and uh, they find it to be a very, uh, a wonderful course. So if you don't have the serve safe certification, the eight hour course ACF offers is, is wonderful as well in the learning center. The exam outline for the culinary cannabis exam is it, it, 90 minutes timed and it has a hundred multiple choice questions. The, the questions are arranged pretty much in the following categories the anatomy of the plant, knowing how to cook with the roots, the stalk, the, the fan leaves, the flower. It, it, you have to, just like as chefs, we talk about cooking an animal from snout to tail. We need to know how to cook with a beautiful cannabis plant from root all the way up to cola. And the cola is a top bud on the very top of the plant. So we, we have to utilize the entire plant. And knowing the anatomy of that plant is how we know how to utilize it, all of it. 10 questions about storing and cooking procedures. Five questions about concentrates and extracts. And concentrates and extracts, I believe, and a lot of studies believe, are really the future 
of the cannabis industry as a whole, not just the culinary cannabis industry, but the cannabis industry as a whole. Uh, so I'm going to be talking uh, a little bit in depth about concentrates and extracts in a little bit. The endocannabinoid system, 20 questions. Uh, uh, the second most questions on, on the exam. Uh, this is something I found fascinating when learning about culinary cannabis is that all animals on this planet, not just humans, but all animals on this planet besides insects have an endocannabinoid system. So most of us know we have a skeletal system. We have a muscular system. We have a vascular system. But many of us don't know that we actually have an endocannabinoid system. And cannabis works in sync with our, our endocannabinoid system. So that, that is why there are so many questions about that on the exam. Terpenes, 15 questions. This is where all the flavor and the aroma comes from. And, and there's so many different flavors and aromas that come with cannabis. There's a plethora of variety of flavors and aroma. Math and po uh, potency, this is very important as far as a dosing standpoint. Just like we never want to overserve anyone alcohol, we never want to overserve anyone cannabis, especially now that cannabis is becoming legal in many states and people are going to be trying it for the first time. The last thing we want to do is overdose them and them be scared off from cannabis and we would lose all the future sales from that customer that we now scared off from overdosing. So understanding how to properly dose using uh, culinary cannabis math to make sure you dose properly is extremely important. And, and by far safety, safety should always be our number one standpoint. And that's why there's roughly 25 questions about safety on the exam. Applicants have to earn 75% on the exam to pass. I'm not going to go too much into this because I understand our time is very limited, but this is just, again, the timeline. I kind of give you a history uh, of where I started, you know, in 2020 when ACF began to offer the new exam. And as of today, I've helped over 50 students earn their specialized certificate in culinary and cannabis from the ACF. Something I'm extremely proud of. Uh, so the State University of New York, I worked for the SUNY system. Uh, SUNY is the, one of the largest comprehensive colleges, universities, and community college systems in the entire United States. We have a total of 64 campuses all around New York State. NCCC is the first SUNY uh, college to offer, offer, uh, uh, offer credit-bearing culinary classes focused on cannabis. Uh, as I was part of the first cohort to receive the certificate. So out of all 64 campuses, talking about the University of Buffalo, Cortland, Binghamton, these major universities, uh, we and I am the first one in the entire system to offer a credit bearing course in uh, culinary cannabis. So that's something I'm extremely proud of. Uh, the history of culinary cannabis, quickly. I, I, it, we, let, let thy food be thy medicine, and then medicine be thy food. Uh, Hippocrates said that in 400 BC, and it's so true. We are what we eat. We are what we consume. And I want you to keep in mind about the endocannabinoid system. Th this is a plant that works directly with a system within our body. We are what we eat. So if, there, if there's a nutrients out there in plant life, we, we want to get those nutrients in, in us to be as healthy and happy as possible. History, again, I find this so incredible. In 1937, the American Medical Association opinion on cannabis, uh, the American Medical Association said they know of no evidence that marijuana is a dangerous drug. So in 1937, the American Medical Association said no, no, no evidence at all that it's dangerous. The same year, in 1937, the director of the FBI, uh, Harold Aslinger, said marijuana is the most violent causing drug in the history of my, mankind. So very different mindsets in 1937 from different agencies within our government. In 1937, the director of FBI, their it, it opinion was there was no drug more uh, dangerous than marijuana. In 1937, the American Medical Association said, there's no evidence that it's a dangerous drug. In 1937, 
uh, the tax act, marijuana tax act happened and it marijuana did not become illegal, but it was virtually impossible to utilize uh, cannabis of any kind after this in 1937. In 1970, uh, cannabis was con uh, scheduled as a controlled one a substance. Uh, out of all substances, controlled one being the harshest examples of controlled one drugs are heroin, LSD, peyote, uh, quaaludes, and then cannabis as well. Uh, it, cannabis is still a schedule one drug. It, and because of that reason, federal research cannot be done in the way it needs to be done within this country. So many doctors within our own country um, have institutes that they not only work for, but own outside of our country and other countries that allow federal research. So a lot of medical research uh, done on, can uh, on cannabis has to be done in other countries because it is a Schedule One drug. Raphael Mesulam, uh, a heartbroken a few, uh, about a month ago, Raphael Mesulam passed away on us. Uh, Raphael Mesulam, he's the grandfather of cannabis research. He discovered THC in 1964, but did not know what it did to the brain. So before 1964, we all knew that cannabis had psychoactive effects on us, but we had no idea, idea why. It wasn't until 1964 when uh, Raphael Mesulam uh, discovered THC. In 1992, he identified the first indigenous cannabinoid neurotransmitter uh, that that uh, nerve sends signals using amandine. So, an indigenous cannabinoid is a cannabinoid that our body makes. So, our body, the human body, makes cannabinoids, endogenous cannabinoids that works with our cannabinoid system. But what also works with our cannabinoid system are phytocannabinoids, and phytocannabinoids are found in the cannabis plant. So the phytocannabinoids work with our human endocannabinoid system, just like our self-made endogenous cannabinoids work with our endocannabinoid system. Aline Howlett discovered uh, our CB1 receptors in the brain in 1988. Uh, all animals with the spinal cord have a CB1 receptor, and it led to the discovery of the endocannabinoid system, which is, again, the largest receptor system in the entire body and re really the master regulator of homeostasis within the human body. THC basically uh, is a molecule that first fits perfectly into our human CB1 receptors like a key and lock. Amandine is a chemical compound that is made by the brain. It serves all the same properties on the cellular level as THC does. This is known as a bliss molecule. The, the, our body creates this on demand or whenever our body needs to, to stay uh, uh, focused in a stressful situation. The, this is what, what leads to what we now know as runner's high. So amandine is self-made THC in words to say. Mitochondria, if any of you know about mitochondria, that's really the powerhouse of the humans, of all cells. And it, it turns out that cannabis not only connects with our neurotransmitters, but cannabis has a direct relate on our mitochondria of our, of our cells, which is just absolutely mind blowing. And that was discovered in 2012. This again, the human endocannabinoid system. Th this is the magic. We have the circulatory system, the nervous, the respiratory, the digestive, the skeletal system, and the muscular system. Would we, would we have here the endocannabinoid system? That that is that, that's what keeps our body in homeostasis. This connects all of our systems together. It's the communicator between all of the systems. There are three main types of cannabinoids that I want you to know about. Endogenous cannabinoids, which our body makes. 
photocannabinoids, and then there are synthetic cannabinoids. So anyone that has heard of uh, uh, K2 or any of these uh, synthetic uh, cannabis substances that you can find at these shops, th those are synthetic cannabinoids. They're, they're not natural. Uh, endogenous and photocannabinoids, again, those are the two types of cannabinoids that really work well with your with your human system. And I, I tell my students, I, I want them to think about it like amino acids. We as humans, we have essential amino acids. Essential amino acids are amino acids that our body make or they, they may make, but not enough uh, supply that our body needs. So essential amino acids are amino acids that we have to go out and eat. There's nine of those. Then there's 11 non-essential amino acids. Those non-essential amino acids, our body makes enough of them uh, to live. Cannabinoids are kind of like the same thing. We are discovering that different everybody makes different amount of endogenous cannabinoids, just like everyone makes different amount of amino acids within their bodies. So when you make different amount of amino acids, you need to seek out the amino acids, consume them to make sure your body's regulated properly. Same thing with phytocannabinoids. You, your body makes cannabinoids, but maybe not enough of certain levels of cannabinoids. So that's where you need to seek out phytocannabinoids. And different. some plants make different uh, cannabinoids, but by far, cannabis makes more phytocannabinoids than any other plant life on this planet, by far. Cannabinoids. The, this is the, the chemical compounds within the plant. There are anywhere between around 113 cannabinoids currently discovered. We're discovering more and more every year. The main cannabinoids that people talk about a lot are CBD and THC. But what I want all of you to know that there's CBG, CBN, CBC, THCV, CBDA, and all these different photocannabinoids have different medicinal benefits. So when you're working with a customer, you, you, the customer may only want THC. The customer may say, hey, I just want to get as high as possible. And if that's what that customer wants to do, okay. But there's going to be many people that want cannabis for its medicinal benefits. And it's good to know what cannabinoid helps what medicinal uh health problem that each person is having. So if you know someone is having a chronic uh, pain or someone can't sleep, you're going to make your food with a different cannabinoid boy that is going to help that person's health benefit. So you can really custom create food, not only with flavor, but with health benefits as well. For a photocannabinoids versus endocannabinoids, the, again, this is what we've been talking about. The, the, the photocannabinoids, the cannabis plants makes, there's about 120 currently discovered. And then the endocannabinoids, which uh, make indigenous cannabinoids. Cannabinoid health benefits. Th this is a great chart. So you can really understand what cannabinoid has what health benefits. Right off the bat, you can see CBD. CBD is just loaded with a ton of health benefits. So uh, it, that is one of the go-to cannabinoids for people that are seeking medicinal benefits from uh, cannabis. But there, you know, CBG has many of them. So does CBGA, CBC, CBDA, and each strain of cannabis is going to have different amounts of photocannabinoids in it. So depending on what photocannabinoids you want is going to be the type of strain you want. So not only do you have to think about strain flavor when cooking with cannabis, but you need to think about uh, strain health benefits as well. This is just another chart here, uh, labeling all the different health benefits of a cannabis and, and the uh, cannabinoids that go with it. And then in boy temperature chart, cannabinoids cook off, they boil off at different temperatures. So uh, the boiling point of THC, the big one is 311 degrees, but certain uh, photocannabinoids such as CBC doesn't boil off until 428 degrees. So depending on what photocannabinoid you're going after, it is, those are the different 
points that you want to keep them of the cooking temperature well under. Terpenes. Ter terpenes are everything. Cannabinoids aren't only the compounds that play when it comes to determining the effects of a particular strain of cannabis. Terpenes or terpenoids play such a crucial role. Terpenes are what gives cannabis its beautiful aroma. So when you take a beautiful whiff of that premium bud or that explosion of aroma that hits you in the face, those are terps. When you take a hit off of a joint and it tastes piney or lemony, those are terps. And when you feel relaxed and calm and uplifted after consuming ca cannabis, you got it. Those are terpenes. Think about terpenes as aromatherapy. It is, aromatherapy is one of the oldest medicines that, that we have as humans. And that's exactly what cannabis is, is aromatherapy when it comes to terpenes, fragrance, and flavor. Terpenes are the plant's essential oil. More than 200 terpenes have been identified in the cannabis plant alone. And every strain of cannabis possesses its own unique terpene profile. The diversity of flavors is, isn't impressive enough, but arguably the most fascinating characteristic of the terpene is the, in, the ability to interact with the cannabinoids. Cannabinoids and terpenes work in sync with each other. They work within synergy of each other. Some terpenes bind to the same receptor sites as cannabinoids, and it can affect how much cannabinoids affect your neurotransmitter. Don't forget about the terpenes. And when I'm talking to my students about this, I really, I drive home the fact, matching terpene flavor profiles of cannabis with food or beverage is the same thing as matching wine or beer with, 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 with food. It's the same concept. We usually would not serve a, a, a deep red wine with, with a mild lean white fish. There, we also would not serve a sweet white wine with a prime rib. Usually th those, those flavors do not match. Same thing with terpenes. If I'm making a beautiful lemon cello tart and I want to infuse it, I want to use a citrus haze strain, something that's going to take on those, those citrusy flavors. But if I'm doing a, a, a roast of, of lamb with mustard and garlic and rosemary and I got strong flavors, I need a sour diesel or, or a, a gorilla glue type strain to meet with the strong flavors of that, of that meat. So it's not only about matching medicinal benefits from the cannabinoids of cannabis, it's also about matching your flavors as well with terpenes. These are some of the, mo the major terpenes that we're talking about. There's, again, there's been over 120 discovered in cannabis alone, which is astounding. There's more terpenes in cannabis than any other plant. So cannabis has more photocannabinoids than any other plant. Cannabis also has more terpenes than any other plant. It's just astounding to me. So not only do, 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 do terpenes have, you know, different aromas, but they have different effects as well. So you want to match your terpenes just like you're matching your endocannabinoids, uh, with your cannabinoids with your endocannabinoid system. And these are very, these are different aromas that we're pretty used to, you know, linalool. If think about lavender, if you, if you know the smell and flavor of lavender, that, that's very common in a lot of cannabis known as linalool. Uh, if you're, you're thinking about uh, pine and rosemary, you want a, a, a pine or uh, mercing, which is found in mangoes. So it, it depends on what terpene flavor you want for what this you are cooking. These are common strains that usually contain these different terpene profiles. We're going to talk about that. We're, we're going to talk about that coming up. I want to lead into strain names mean nothing at all. Strain names are a selling point. They mean nothing. If we, if we order champagne, we know it came from Champagne, France. If we order burgundy, we know it came from burgundy, France. Strain names mean nothing. 
one dispensaries, one one farmer example of Gorilla Glue can be totally different than another farmer. There are no regulations when it comes to strain names. So whenever shopping for cannabis, disregard strain names. They mean nothing. The only things that you want to be going after are your terpene profiles and your cannabinoid profiles. The, 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 the strain name means nothing at all. That being said, each dispensary, each grower should have a cannabis strain flavor wheel that is associated with the cannabis that they grow. Because again, every cannabis cultivator has a flavor associated to match their own strains. Every day, people are crossbreeding, creating new strains of cannabis. No true strains exist anymore. There's, there's no pure indicas out there. There's no pure sativas out there. Everything is a hybrid. There are indica dominant hybrids. There are sativa dominant hybrids, but there are no true sativa or indicas anymore out there. Everything is a hybrid. There's no universal regulations or regulations at all when it comes to strain name purity. So please keep in mind, strain names mean nothing. But with this particular um, cultivator, their, their strains that they have are on the outer side of their wheel. So they have super lemon haze, which is similar to the lemon skunk, which if you're looking for lime flavor, citrus, sour, that is the type of strains they're going to go after. You should ask your cultivator, your dispensary, your farmer, for their flavor wheel. And if they don't have a flavor wheel, that is where you as a chef can, can use your skills and, and create this for a financial benefit. You can show a farmer, explain to them how every farmer has these types of wheel, uh, flavor wheels. Talk to them about the strains they grow and create a, far, uh, uh, a flavor wheel for their PR to work along with your restaurant. The entourage effect, the entourage effect. Dr. Masulam coined this phrase, the entourage effect, to help explain what many medical cannabis patients already noticed for decades. Whole plant cannabis works better than synthetic cannabinoids or cannabinoids on their own. The, the whole plant works better than the sum of its plant parts. This is what has really, really... Um, uh, led Rick Simpson to develop RSO style uh, tinctures, oils, concentrates. RSO stands for Rick Simpson style oil. And th th those concentrates use every part of the plant. So you get the entourage effect. And again, the entourage effect is when, when the whole plant works better than the sum of its parts. Your terpenes work with your flavonoids, which work with your cannabinoids, which gives you the entourage effect. We just, I said we're going to talk about the anatomy of the plant for a little bit. And, you know, what I want a lot of you just to know right off the bat is trichomes are where the THC is. Ti trichomes are the tiny resin gland fills that cover the surfaces of the bud, of the flowers. They contain the vast majority of THC. So vast majority of the THC, almost all the THC in the plant is in that very outside gland-like resin-filled uh, caps on the outside known as trichomes. This is why when working with cannabis flower, you want to have gloves on. And personally, when I'm working with cannabis, I have a tray and I have a sharp pair of kitchen shears and I'm trimming my cannabis down to the appropriate size. The last thing I personally am ever going to do is put my cannabis in a grinder of any kind. And I know many people out there love their grinders, but when you grind your cannabis, you are literally grinding all of the trichomes they are falling off and they're falling into your grinder. And yes, I know there's there's catchers. I know some of you may scrape your grinder, but you think about oxidization. Oxidization, oxygen is going to decay anything. And when you have trichomes, these minuscule little glands full of resin, when you grind those glands up, you're creating more surface area. You're oxidizing them. Your THC is going to decrease. 
So it, one thing I personally would never utilize at all is a grinder of any kind. Cannabis concentrates. Um, th this is where a lot of the future of the industry is going. A lot of people believe this. Um, Frenchy Cannoli. Uh, Frenchy Cannoli here, he passed away several years ago. He was a master hashishian maker. Uh, he, he, he spent his life learning how to make the best hash on the planet. Why concentrates are so, so important in the future of the cannabis industry? Because when we work with whole flower, when we work with buds of the plant, the buds, the flower of the plant are green. They're green because of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll because of photosynthesis. Chlorophyll has a very bitter flavor to it. So if any of you have ever consumed cannabis edibles of any kind, and it had a grassy flavor to it, what you are tasting is the chlorophyll. We don't want to taste chlorophyll. So when you're working and cooking with cannabis concentrates, they are, for the most part, are going to be chlorophyll free which is going to give your food a non-grassy flavor. And that's what so many people, cannabis food or beverage, they, they get turned off by is that grassy flavor. So not only from that standpoint, is there no chlorophyll, you can work with dispensaries and, and cultivators and you can get different terpenes extracted that you want with different cannabinoids that you want into the concentrate you want. So if I wanted a, a, a concentrate with lots of linalool terpenes in it and a lot of CBG cannabinoids in it, they can extract just CBG cannabinoid, just linalool terpene and create me a concentrate with exactly the flavor and cannabinoid profile that I want as a, as a chef, which is beautiful. That is really where the industry is leading to. Also, when you, and from the business standpoint, when you're working with whole flour, that has a very short shelf life. Whole flour has a short shelf life. It takes up a lot of space storing whole flour. We have to keep that under lock and key for security purposes. You're going to take up a lot of square footage in your facility. So it has a short shelf life. You have to keep a tight eye on it. Whole flour, you also have to go through the decarbing process before you can really, really utilize it in your cooking. So if you don't decarb your cannabis properly, you're going to lose out on a lot of the cannabinoids. It's an extra step in the process. When you're working with concentrates, a lot of time they're pre-decarbed. They have a very, a lot of times they have a longer shelf life than flour and they're much more compact. You can lock these up in your office desk drawer opposed to locking up pounds and pounds of cannabis somewhere in your office. So there's many great cannabis concentrates out there. Depending on what you are cooking, depending on what you are creating, you're going to choose a concentrate that works best for you. What I want you to know, out of all the concentrates, and there's more and more being developed every year, there are only three of them, only three that are solvent free, meaning there's no butane or propane or any type of solvent in them. Uh, aspirin is made with solvents. A lot of things we consume every day are made with solvents of some kind to extract the different properties from the plant. Uh, but there are three that are actually solvent list free. The, the three would be bubble hash, keef, and rose, uh, rosin, rosin. So we have bubble hash, which, again, you know, ha ha has, has seeds, hash, has been around for, it is one of the, old, it is the oldest concentrate in humankind. We, uh, we've been making hash for thousands of years. Keef is just all the ground up trichomes collected together. So when you have a whole bunch of uh, dried up uh, uh, collected trichomes, that's just simply known as keef or dry sieve. So you can turn that into what's known as bubble has. But what is really taking the, the country and world by storm is rosin. Rosin is the, really uh, the new age solventless free uh, concentrate that is that is is, is solventless free plus a lot of these other ones you would need tens of thousands of dollars of equipment and to try to make in your own kitchen 
rosin is something you can make in your kitchens. Uh, depending on the quality that you want to make it, when you can make a, a, a you can buy a rosin press for anywhere from two hundred and fifty dollars to twenty five thousand dollars. It depends on the quantity. If you want to press, uh, a, you know, a, a couple grams at a time, or if you want to press a couple pounds at a time into a rosin. Again, why would you want to cook with concentrates? You can choose your exact flavor profile, your exact cannabinoid flavor, longer shelf life, no um, uh, chlorophyll flavor, uh, and uh, less security to worry about. These right here, I have a wonderful, wonderful wife who is a math teacher, a sixth grade math teacher for, uh, for Buffalo Public Schools. I don't know how she does it, but she does it. I'm a culinary teacher at a college. So I think between the two jobs, I might have the one that's a little more fun. But when I was really learning about culinary cannabis, one thing I could not find anywhere were culinary cannabis doses match, math formulas. So these formulas right here, uh, as far as I know, were created by me and my wife, uh, my wife and I, who were trying to prepare me for the culinary cannabis exam. So the, the, the first formula is the formula for infusion. If you needed the amount of, of infusion, if you were making can of butter or can of oil, uh, the amount of infusion you would need for a recipe. The other one is the amount of formula you would need for dosage. So those are two formulas that I was not able to locate anywhere that I really uh, I work with my wife trying to create. How to activate THC. A lot of us may or may not know that you just can't consume raw cannabis. It won't have any psychoactive effects on you. You have to remove the acid molecule off of the end of the THC chain. So you have to go through a process of decarbing. Again, when you're decarbing, you want to make sure you keep your, your, uh, your, terpene, your, your temperature below at least 314 degrees to make sure your THC does not boil off. There's two main methods of decarbing. You can do the baking method. Uh, the baking method is the most traditional method. You would heat an oven up to 240 degrees, spread freshly ground cannabis flour. I, I, again, I would trim the cannabis flour myself into the size of about popcorn pieces and I would trim my flour and put it on a glass plate, pie plate. Why glass? Glass has better heat distribution uh, in an even layer. And I want to cover that plate with aluminum foil, crimping the foil around the rim to seal. And this is something a lot of people don't understand about decarbing. Many people have been decarbing cannabis their whole life, but they completely uncovered. And that's fine. But the science of it is when you cover your cannabis when decarbing it, your terpenes are going to evaporate. And if it's uncovered, they're going to evaporate up into the air. But if your, your, your tray, your glass pie plate is covered, your terpenes are going to evaporate, hit the top of the aluminum foil, form a condensation. You're going to take that out of the oven, allow it to cool before you uncover it. And those are going to evaporate. They're going to lead themselves. Those terps are going to blend back into the cannabis flower. So the best way to decarb in the oven is by covering your, your glass pie plate with aluminum foil. The other method is a sous vide method. Uh, sous vide method is where you set your sous vide cooker to 200 degrees. You immerse your cannabis in a sealed bag in hot water and allow it to simmer for four to six hours. To make infusions then, you just simply take your decarb cannabis with melted butter, oil, or glycerin, and simmer it for another four to six hours. That is my overall PowerPoint for the most part of the culinary cannabis. And I know time is running tight. I just want, to, it, it, want everyone to understand. So I offer culinary cannabis lecture style course at NFCI. It meets one day a week. Uh, three out for two and a half hours for two and a half hours one day a week for the entire semester. So there's 15 classes. Each one's about two and a half hours. That is a lecture style class. That lecture class gets students prepared for the ACF exam. At the end of my class, they take the ACF exam here at a uh, here at NFCI. As of right now, knock on wood, over the course of two and a half years. 
I have a hundred percent pass rate on the ACF uh, exam with my students. Once my students take my lecture class starting this fall, I am proud to announce that it's just been approved. I am going to be teaching the first ever credit bearing lab style cannabis class in the SUNY system. We are actually going to be cooking with cannabis in my lab class. My lecture class is going to be a prerequisite to take my lab class. So once the students take my lecture class that gets them prepared for the ACF exam, they can then take my lab class. What is very amazing to me is that we have an amazing horticulture program as well at MCCC. Our horticulture class has selectively picked a, a, a strain of hemp that has less than 0.3% THC in it that we're going to grow on campus in our greenhouse and then transport it to NFCI. And we are then going to cook with it in my lab class. It will be a true farm to table cannabis method. And I think the first in the entire nation. So we're going to be growing our own hemp and utilizing the hemp, flower, stalks, roots, seeds, everything in from our horticulture class in the greenhouses, and then using that at the Culinary Institute in my new lab class. So that's starting this fall. We're going to be meeting once a week for 15 weeks, and that will be a six hour uh, lab style class. Getting ready for this lab class, I needed a lot of new culinary cannabis equipment that I, I did not have or the school did not have. So behind me, you may hopefully see a lot of the different culinary cannabis cooking equipment that I'm, that I'm going to be use, utilizing. This is a rosin press. These plates heat up to an exact temperature that you can program in here, usually under 200 degrees. They both heat up and you can apply anywhere between 500 to 6,000 pounds of presser per square inch. So both of these heat plates heat up to an exact temperature and then you press and squeeze the cannabis in there. When you do that, you create an extract. That extract is known as rosin. That's the solvent-free uh, concentrate that I was talking about that we can all make in our own kitchens if you have a press. That press right there is very heavy. Just got it about a month or two ago, uh, and that one ran, uh, ran us about $3,000. So those plates heat up and press. It turns out a lot of brewers are using rosin presses to press hops for different styles of AP, IPAs. So I, I actually have pressed a rosemary in, in there and created a rosemary style rosin. So you're creating your own concentrates. Once you press a lot of your cannabis flour and you get that rosin, you have leftover cannabis that you pressed. That's where this tool comes into play. You take all your leftover cannabis that you press, and those are known as pucks, and you put them in this magnetic electric hot plate and you simmer your pucks just a way to make a cannabis style stock, if you will. So we, we or remulage, if you will, even, because we, we, we pressed our cannabis in the, in the, in the rosin press, but then we, we extracted that beautiful extract, but we still have flour in that press. What can we do with that? We can, you, we can simmer that again. We also have infusers. I know that this looks a lot like a coffee maker, but this is a, a, a level uh, infuser. So we're going to infuse uh, different oils, different butters. And then something that's very cool is known as a T-check style machine. So this T-check style machine is going to allow us to test uh, different cannabis flour and the concentrates that we make. So we, we take our flour or our concentrates, we place it on a slide, you place that slide into this machine, this machine hooks up Bluetooth to your cell phone and gives you an exact readout of your THC content. So this is known as a T-check style machine, a very high tech, 
Uh, so this is all different equipment that my school uh, purchased for me, believing in this. So I'm very proud of my school, uh, that they are being proactive and not reactive, having that growth mindset. And understand that this is it's the golden age. It's the green age. Cannabis is not coming. Cannabis is here. You can choose to utilize this product in a safe manner and increase sales, uh, increase flavor, increase health benefits of your food. Uh, it's just about all doing it in a safe and effective way. I, 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 that, I know it's 350, so I know we're running a little uh, close on uh, end of time here. So with that, th this time I'm wondering if there are any questions. Yes, thank you, Chef. So fascinating and um, amazing to hear about the new course, the lab course that'll be launching soon. Um, we do have several questions. We won't be able to get to all of the questions, but I think that just speaks to that this is a very popular topic and um, many chefs are very interested. So one of the questions um, that we received from several folks is wondering, can they um, enroll in your theory or lab class or, or is it only for your degree student? No, so no. So I knew I want, I made both of these courses non-matriculated. So any student uh, can take uh, my courses at the college. So I've had the theater students, math students. So we are driving enrollment up at NFCI by all the different other majors wanting to take this course. Not only that, I built it so it is integrated with our workforce development program. So, so many chefs locally can take this through workforce development as a non-credit bearing class. So that is driving our enrollment up, which anyone that understands anything about education today, enrollment is usually going down. And, and this course is driving enrollment up and my, my administration sees that. Excellent, wonderful. Um, and in your coursework, do you also cover usage in pastry applications as well? Yeah, oh, at beverage, pastry, culinary, and, and it's not only just culinary and pastry, it really is mixology as well, uh, because uh, at least in New York State, you're not going to be able to serve alcohol and cannabis under the same roof. So you want to utilize cannabis in every way uh, uh, within your brick and mortar establishment. So that means in beverages as well. So we go very deep, yes, in, in pastry and culinary, but also in beverage. Excellent. All right. And um, another viewer was wondering if you might be able to share some examples of what types of jobs might be available for chefs who are interested in going into the cannabis industry. Uh, it, the private party sector, I, I literally, I can't keep up with it myself. I, there are so many people that want a chef to come into their home and have a dinner party, but an infused dinner party. And not only do they want the infused dinner party, that chef teaching the guest at that dinner party how to work with cannabis. It, I, I can't tell you how many private catering events I have to turn down all the time. So I think that is a big, uh, a big pasture for chefs. I think chefs are going to work uh, uh, well with farmers creating their different flavor wheels as well. And, and, and like, much like we have wine sommeliers, we're going to need cannabis sommeliers too. So it, there, there are just a plethora of new job opportunities that are out there. And that's why this ACF certification is so important because everyone can claim that they know about cannabis. But ACF is a national recognized organization. And when you can get a cannabis certification through the American Culinary Federation, that it's just like any other ACF certification. It's just going to drive home uh, to your employer, uh, your customers, that how professional you take this matter. Excellent. Well, thank you. That kind of leads into the next question. Um, someone is saying that they are seeing a lot about infused dinners, um, but how might this work if everyone has a different tolerance level? Yeah, yeah, and you know the great question. That's where microdosing is really going to come in. And microdosing is around three point five to five milligrams per serving. 
And th this is where you have to work with your customer and you, you have to have an honest conversation with someone and, and understand their tolerance. Uh, it's much like if you're wor working with someone to create a custom cocktail for them, you know, you're going to create a different cocktail for someone that is trying alcohol for the very first time in their life rather than someone who has been drinking scotch or whiskey for the past 50 years of their life. They're going to have a different tolerance level. And I think that's where dosing takes place. Just like anything, you can always dose someone more, but you can't undose them. So it's important to slowly dose someone and understand the effects can take a half hour, an hour to feel. And that's where the concentrates really come into play too, because if you are doing a dinner party and everyone's getting the same food, you can make it all very, very low dosage, but have a concentrate that you literally have in an eyedropper and drop on top of each uh, item on the plate to increase that particular guest uh, dosage needs. Uh, and, and that's what makes the, these concentrates so amazing. Isolate, cannabis isolate is totally flavorless and odorless. You can you can take isolate and just put it in water and, and, and drink the water and you will have, feel the THC. So just taking THC isolate and, and using it almost as a finishing salt. And I've done that. I've done cannabis finishing salt. So there's another example. If someone says they want even more THC, I'm going to bust out my really strong THC finishing salt and finish their plate with that. So those are just a few examples. Excellent. Well, um, as you mentioned, I know we're coming short on time, but um, for anyone that has questions, just know that we will continue this conversation for chefs who, and students who are interested in learning more about culinary cannabis. And um, Chef, we can certainly feel your passion for this topic um, through the screen today. So we're wondering if you had any final thoughts that you'd like to share with those who are tuning in or watching the recording. I Yes, and thank you again for everyone coming to this this webinar event. I, I've really spent the last five years of my professional life uh, dedicating myself to the culinary cannabis industry. I, I just want to be a caretaker for it. I want to leave it in a better condition than how I found it. I, I found the culinary ca cannabis industry is non-existent. And here I am, and I get to be on the forefront of a new industry with a new ingredient. And it's just so exciting. So, you know, it's just like anything maybe on your menu. Maybe you're not a vegan, uh, but you know you need vegan dishes on your menu. Maybe you don't like Impossible Burger, but you know they're good sales, so you put Impossible Burger on your menu. Maybe Cannabis might be the same thing. And to anyone out there, that does suffer, suffer from medical conditions. I personally have seen the medicinal benefits of cannabis work on countless people. You all have an endocannabinoid system in you. You take care of your muscular systems. You take care of your vascular and skeletal systems. Please take care of your endocannabinoid system and seek out other phytocannabinoids that will help give you that, that homeostasis effect and that overall entourage effect that you need that, that you need to be mind center every single day. So thank you for your your, your growth mindset. Uh, think about this as a big money maker profit, being on the forefront of it. And thank you again for being proactive and not re reactive and leading the way in this industry. Well, a huge virtual round of applause as we thank Chef Koshelski from Niagara Culinary Institute in New York. We appreciate you taking the time to share your skills and your enthusiasm for cannabis education with our community of culinary professionals and students today. So thank you very, very much. And for those of you tuning in, please be on the lookout for the survey that you'll receive tomorrow with the recording and Chef's handouts. You'll need to uh, complete the survey in order to earn your one hour of ACF CEA. Again, we hope that you'll join us next week for our webinar as we'll explore the cuisines of Guam with Hunter Gentry, live from the Greenbrier Resort in West Virginia. And on April 28th, we will have a webinar on aperitivo and happy hour menu ideas with Belgioso. We can't wait to see you in the Big Easy. Please visit acfchefs.org and click on the events tab to register now for ACF National Convention to be held July 16th through the 19th at the New Orleans Convention Center.
And also instructors, please don't miss the opportunity to join us in New Orleans for the one day Culinary Educator Summit on July 16th. Amazing opportunity to learn by attending seminars and demos by culinary instructors and deans from across the country on this three day workshop before the convention. At ACF National Convention, we will also have a culinary cannabis session for those of you who want to learn more. And again, thank you for joining us. On behalf of the ACF National Office, we appreciate you tuning in today and we'll see you all soon. Have a great day.